Hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Stewart. I work at the Maryland Department of the Environment as the Climate Change Program Manager. Uh, I recognize a number of you from previous listening sessions, so thanks so much for coming back for this show. Uh, what, you, uh, what you might know, or what uh, I want to inform everyone of briefly here, is that uh, I have a short presentation, and then I'm going to hand things over to uh, Dr. Kathleen Kennedy, who's going to walk through the results of the analysis that her team at the University of Maryland did to examine what are some policy options that the state of Maryland has to achieve its goals of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, climate pollution, uh, by 60% by 2031. So I'll get, get into the goals a little bit. Um, but just giving you a lay of the land, what we're going to do is we're, we have some uh, presentation material and we're sp going to spend most of the time that we have in this 90 minute session uh, in discussion so that we can really get input uh, from you as uh, the state starts to sort of uh, formalize its ideas around what the policies should be to help achieve uh, the the uh, the ambitious climate goals that uh, Maryland has. So um, before we dive in, though, I uh, want to ask, are there any elected officials in the room or staff of elected officials? And, and uh, if you'd want to introduce yourself, that'd be awesome. Right, Matt. Uh, w. Matt Moore, I represent North St. Mary's in General Assembly. Uh, Delegate Mark Fisher, I represent this district that you're in, and thank you for having me uh, this meeting and hearing here because it, it, it means a lot to have us in Cowper County. Thank you for being here. Wait, did I see one other raise their hand? No? Okay. Um, we have sign-in sheets. I know not everyone was able, thank you, um, was able to sign in when you came in. That's fine. Uh, on your way out, um, if you're able to sign in, that would be really helpful for us. Um, uh, and, um, and also, I, I'm not sure if we still have any of the staff here from the college. Just what, really wanted to thank the college for hosting uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment here uh, for tonight's listening session. So. Um, uh, quick, uh, the presentation that we have, again, quick, quick background on the topic here, uh, and then I'll be turning things over to Kathleen Kennedy to talk about Maryland's climate pathway. Um, I, I think uh, we're actually going to skip over uh, doing a break, and, and instead we can just dive right into audience comments and Q&A. Uh, but do feel free at any point. If you feel like you need to stand up and stretch your legs, uh, by all means, don't hesitate. So uh, what's the topic? The topic is climate change. Uh, the United States is warming, the planet's warming, Maryland is warming faster than the United States uh, on average. As, uh, as our uh, global average or, or uh, average annual temperatures increase in Maryland, we're winding up with more precipitation. Uh, that's heavier rain events, more frequent, uh, or, or I'm sorry, he heavier rain events it, with a different frequency. So we wind up having uh, periods of drought followed by periods of extreme rainfall. Uh, that's causing a number of issues. Uh, obviously, flooding is a direct impact, but we're really experiencing climate change in a number of ways across the state. Uh, when I grew up, I've, I've been in Maryland my whole life. Um, when I was growing up in Maryland, we used to go uh, skiing pretty regularly. It's uh, tough, of course, for me to get the kids skiing anywhere in the mid-Atlantic because of the, um, the unpredictable uh, snow that we now have in our, in our warming climate. Um, we have our, um, uh, my family uh, who lives in historic Ellica City has been displaced uh, twice now from uh, so-called 500 year flooding events that have uh, really devastated parts of uh, historical city and other parts of the state. Um, we're experiencing sea level rise uh, throughout the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we're set to lose half of Dorchester County uh, within my lifetime because of sea level rise. Um, I've got a nephew who's struggling from Lyme disease, which is a disease that the territory of, of Lyme disease is spreading as the uh, ticks that carry Lyme disease, it's, their habitat is spreading thanks to climate change. So anyhow, we're, we're experiencing climate change in a number of different ways, um, uh, which is among the reasons why 
Maryland has a long history of being a climate leader. Uh, Maryland has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions about 30 percent since uh, 2006. Uh, that's faster than just about every other state, and yes, faster than California. California is often held up as the climate leader. Uh, they're doing some amazing work. I don't want, want to dismiss the great work that they're doing, but we've actually reduced emissions faster than California, um, and we have goals to continue reducing our emissions uh, on into the future. So thanks to the Maryland General Assembly in 2022, they passed the Climate Solutions Now Act, which requires that Maryland reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions 60% by 2031 and achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. The Maryland Department of the Environment, or MDE, is required to, by the end of this year, produce the plan that lays out the policies that the state will enact in order to achieve those statutory requirements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we are also authorized to promulgate regulations uh, in order to achieve those goals. Uh, don't, um, uh, a point that I really want to make, these are the most ambitious goals of any U.S. state. So the, the types of policies that we're looking at um, are not uh, completely uncommon in the United States, but one of the things that you'll see in the Pathway Report is that we're really looking at some of the most uh, ambitious policies that are being enacted in other states and putting them all together into our pathway and our plan to achieve our uh, requirements of reducing statewide greenhouse gas emissions 60% by 2031. Um, so with that, let me turn things over to Dr. Kennedy to talk about what's in Maryland's climate pathway. So the goal of the Maryland's Climate Pathway Report was to model a pathway to reach the state targets that Mark just laid out. So we do this by analyzing two different scenarios. The first is the current policies scenario, which includes all of the policies that are on the books here in Maryland already, as well as relevant federal policies such as the Inflation Reduction Act. So this lets us see how close we are to achieving the goal with what's already on the books. And we find that with full implementation of those current policies, Maryland can achieve 51% reductions by 2031. So this is a good start, but there's still a gap to be closed to reach the 60% goal. The second scenario is the Maryland's climate pathway scenario. And this layers additional policies on top of those existing policies to reach the 60% goal and the net zero goal in 2045. And this is truly a all of society approach within this pathway where we think about how to achieve reductions across all sectors of the economy and how actions can be put together from state, local, federal level government, as well as non-governmental organizations, individuals, all working together to achieve these reductions. And we find with this kind of inclusive approach, uh, the pathway can also realize substantial benefits for Marylanders. So starting with a little bit of context, this is the trajectory of emissions under the state's goals, starting on the left from 2006, which is the baseline year for all of the state's goals. So all of the percent reductions that I'm talking about tonight are all relative to 2006. And you can see Maryland has already been reducing emissions substantially thanks to previous policies like the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Act and others. But we still have to um, increase our ambition a bit more to reach these new goals of 60% by 2031 and net zero by 2045. The pathway report focuses primarily on the 2031 goal, so that's what I'm gonna talk about the most tonight, but I will mention a few things as well uh, more relevant to 2045. So this figure is a summary of the pathway to 2031 and that 60% reduction goal. So starting on the left, we have all of the greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland in 2006, again, the state baseline year. And so really what we're trying to do is get from this left-hand bar over to the right, which is 60% reduction from there. And the first step in this is recognizing all of the work Maryland has already done. So the historical reductions in emissions as of the state's latest inventory in 2020 get us about halfway there. And then all of these additional bars going across the graph are the different sectors of the economy in the state's emission inventory. And you can see each one has a different shading. Um, so the, the lighter shading on top comes from that current policy scenario that I described. So everything that's already on the books in Maryland. 
and you can see that substantial reductions are achieved just under those current policies. The darker shading below is Maryland's climate pathway and the additional policies that we layer on top to reach the goal. So now I'm going to walk through each of these sectors and talk about what those actual policies are that reach the goal. So starting with the electricity sector, we modeled an 89% reduction in emissions. This is the largest percent reduction of any of the sectors. And this comes from 100% clean energy sources by 2035. It also involves collaboration across Maryland and with neighboring states to make sure that not only the energy produced here in Maryland is clean, but also anything that's imported from surrounding states is also from clean sources. This also involves boosting renewable energy deployment and accessibility, for example, through using things like the solar tax credits from the federal government. And I'll also mention each of these slides is going to have a picture like this. So the dashed line going across is the emissions under current policies. And then the shaded areas are the state inventory categories under Maryland's climate pathway. And so you can see going forward how the two scenar scenarios diverge and the emissions are lower under Maryland's climate pathway. Now looking at the transportation sector. Here we modeled a 49% reduction in emissions, and this comes from things like smart growth and zoning reform to reduce overall vehicle miles traveled. It also involves ensuring access to state and federal incentives to support the transition to electric vehicles. We also model the adoption of California's Clean Fleets regulation, which is for heavy duty vehicles and freight. We also model 100% electric bus sales by 2025. And we model some electrification of non-road sources, things like lawnmowers, commercial forklifts, things like this. Next in the building sector, we model a 35% reduction. And this comes from zero emissions appliance standards, which can both improve air quality as well as reducing emissions. We also model zero emissions construction standard for new buildings. And we extend the energy efficiency standards that the state already has in place. In the industrial sector, we model a 79% reduction in emissions. This comes from buy clean policies that can support uh, cleaner production of manufactured products. We also model a switch in fuel use in cement industry away from coal. And this is something that's actually already underway because the two cement facilities in the state have their own internal corporate goals to reduce emissions as well. And so they both have plans to switch away from coal already and are working toward that goal. And finally, we include the manufacturing sector in decarbonization efforts. So right now, um, there is an exemption from the GGRA that means that the manufacturing sector cannot be regulated in their emissions. And we, in this modeling, um, do include them fully in all of these policies. Next, we have industrial processes and product use, which sees a 46% reduction in emissions. So this is a bit different from the previous slide which was fuel combustion emissions in industry. Here, we're looking at process emissions, so things that come from chemical reactions or product use, so other non-CO2 gases uh, that come from products uh, like air conditioning or refrigeration. So here, we model lower process-related emissions in cement manufacturing. We also include the use of carbon capture and storage to reduce cement emissions beyond 2035. So that's something we don't necessarily expect to contribute to the 2031 goal because it is still a developing technology, but it could support that 2045 net zero goal. And finally, we see a reduction in non-CO2 emissions from sources like air conditioning and refrigeration. Next in the fossil fuel sector, we modeled a 26% reduction in emissions. This comes from an overall reduction in natural gas use across all of the sectors that I'm talking about here as well as widespread monitoring of natural gas infrastructure for leaks, et cetera. And we try to do all of this while thinking about how to ensure affordability and no increased cost to Marylanders, especially for vulnerable communities. In the waste management sector, we model a 40% reduction in emissions. Um, so this comes from increasing recycling and waste diversion away from landfills, and in particular, thinking about how we can improve access to composting. In the agricultural sector, we model a 9% reduction. This is smaller than some of the other sectors. This is partly because the agriculture sector in Maryland has already been implementing best practices for many years now. So here we see the continuation of those policies that are already in place, 
as well as pursuing some zero cost options for mitigation in the livestock sector. So these would not be anything that cause additional cost burden to farmers, only things that would be zero cost or cost savings. And the last sector is a bit different from the others. This is the forestry and land use sector. So you'll note that the numbers here on the graph are all negative. So this means that the sector is actually absorbing more CO2 than it's emitting. So the 2031 goal is actually a gross emissions goal, which means that these negative emissions don't count toward it. But for the net zero goal, this is really important. So protecting and expanding these natural emission sinks will be critical for reaching net zero. And we don't uh, do as much analysis on this one because it's not relevant to the 2031 goal that was the focus of this report, but we do plan to expand analysis in future. And the last policy I want to mention is an economy-wide policy, so this would cover all of the sectors that I just walked through, and that's a cap and invest program where the proceeds from this program would be reinvested to support Marylanders, and overall this program delivers about 4% of the emissions reductions out of that 60% needed to hit the goal. And as I mentioned before, this pathway can produce benefits for Marylanders, so this is a quick summary of some of those benefits. First, on the climate side, on the left, uh, we do hit the 60% emissions reduction goal, which not only um, reduces emissions here in Maryland, but can also contribute to national and global reduction goals. But this also brings with it reduction in co-pollutants. And so that can bring significant health benefits to Marylanders as well. So the middle column here is a look at some of those health benefits. This is a snapshot just of 2031 itself. And in that year, we would expect to see up to 1,000 fewer cases of upper and lower rep respiratory symptoms, up to 51 lives saved, and over 16,500 fewer days of restricted activity from pollution. This also translates into economic benefits, which is the last column. This is now cumulative through 2031. And we find that over that time period, health benefits can total up to between $1 and $2.4 billion. The pathway can also produce 16,700 new jobs and can result in a $1.5 billion increase in personal income. So the pathway also thinks about not just what we need to do, but how we can think about implementing these policies. So now I'm gonna talk through each of these sectors and think about some of the particular considerations and opportunities that go along with each one. So first in the electricity sector, decarbonizing electricity also enables the decarbonization of many other sectors where electrification is a key solution. So for instance, if you want to charge your EV, you wanna charge that with clean electricity. So for this sector, we wanna think about how to make this an equitable transition, and in particular, think about making sure that everyone has access to the incentives um, for this sector. In the transportation sector, we wanna talk about how to overcome barriers to the electric vehicle transition and how to reduce overall vehicle miles traveled. Affordability is a really key consideration for this, making sure that everyone is able to purchase an EV if they want one. We also wanna think about access to charging infrastructure, so particularly for those who maybe don't own their own home and can't install their own charger, how can they have access to that infrastructure? And we also wanna think about access to public transit so that people can get around even without a car as needed. In the building sector, we want to make sure that efficient and clean building technologies are available to everyone. Again, affordability is a really key concern here. And thinking about how we can make sure these technologies are available both to those who own their own home and those who rent. Next, in the industrial sector, we know that decarbonizing the industrial sector can be challenging, but it has a large untapped potential. And a really key way to achieve this potential is through stakeholder engagement, so working with the companies that already do have goals, as I mentioned, for the cement industry, and how um, the state can support their efforts. And there's also room for research and innovation in this sector where there may not be a perfect solution yet and more work is needed to develop those technologies going forward. Waste management is an opportunity not just to achieve greenhouse gas reductions, but also to support equity within the state. Uh, this is a sector that produces a lot of pollution, and so thinking about how we can reduce that and reduce overall production of waste um, can support some really key goals for the state. And finally, the land and agriculture sector can contribute to emissions reductions, but can also support other goals for the state, such as uh, supporting the Chesapeake Bay. 
So here, policies can improve soil health, they can preserve and expand forest sinks, and they can also improve water and air quality. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark. And sorry for the uh, audio issues. Maybe as we switch mics, that might get better. Um, so we, um, we want to direct you, if, it, if some of you might feel comfortable sharing your input, your comments, um, and suggestions uh, live tonight. Others might prefer to put that in writing. Um, or you want to do both. Uh, we have a website set up. Uh, up on the screen here, feel free to, um, to submit written comments. We're accepting written comments uh, through October 15th. Um, so with that, I think that we're gonna jump into Q&A. We're gonna switch mics. Hopefully that corrects this kind of background issue that we're getting, but, um, but if it doesn't, then I apologize. We could try muting the system if it gets too annoying. Um, so uh, first, let's ask, um, uh, let me ask if there are any questions about anything that uh, Dr. Kennedy just presented specifically in terms of the modeling that the University of Maryland did uh, to support the state's plans. So yeah, sir. Why does the word nuclear never appear on any of the slides, particularly the electricity slide? Please explain that. So um, nuclear is very much included in the pathway. It's just that these slides are showing new policies. The state already has nuclear plants that are operational. And so um, in our modeling, we assume that those nuclear plants will continue to operate and will continue to generate electricity in the state. Um, through 2031, the plants are already licensed, so they'll be there no matter what. For the 2045 goal, we do assume that they are relicensed and continue, but that would have to occur to make that um, actually happen. Uh, can I follow up on this? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you want feedback now or do you want to wait for my feedback later? If, if it's feedback on the policy decisions that the state's going to make, then hold off on that for a moment. I wanted to just get any questions out about the content that was presented, any, any clarifications that you're looking for uh, from Dr. Kennedy before we get into more of the, the policy input. Um, although we can also just blend this and, and go right into it. Actually, you know, a number of hands came up, so why don't we just come full circle uh, to, to addressing all of the questions that you have, uh, and, and, uh, and which we'll turn to in a second. I have a couple of survey questions for the room. These are questions that we're trying to get input in um, from all of the audiences that we've been meeting with through these stakeholder sessions uh, to help us uh, with some policy decisions that are kind of front and center in front of the agencies. So first, Governor Moore set a goal for Maryland to achieve 100% clean power by 2035. By the end of this year, the agencies will recommend a policy to achieve that goal. We would like your input on what you think the state should qualify as clean power resources. So what I'll do is I'll read off a number of different clean power, uh, or I, I, I don't mean to suggest that these are clean power sources. I'm gonna list off a number of different uh, power generation sources and just put your hand up if you think that one of those sources you consider to be a clean source uh, and keep your hand down if you do not consider that to be a clean source. I, we've learned, asking this question, that we accept uh, wiggly hands as it's, it's nuanced. You know, maybe you sometimes think that solar is a clean power source, but not on farms. Like, so we get the nuanced question too, or the, the nuanced response too. Um, all right, so if you believe that uh, solar power is a clean so resource, then put your hands up. Clean, and you can use kind of whatever definition you want to define clean for yourself. Okay. Thank you. Wind power. All right, thank you. Hydro power. Does that include offshore? Hi well, hydro is usually uh, power generated at a dam. So, not so wouldn't, that's, it, I mean, traditionally, no, we're, we're really talking about dam-generated power. 
So with that, uh, hydropower generated a dam. Some nuance there. Okay, thank you. Uh, nuclear power. All right, thank you. Uh, woody biomass, that means burning uh, wood uh, trees for electricity production. Okay, thank you. Uh, and finally, municipal solid waste, i.e. trash incineration. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. Um, if your home heating system breaks and you call a contractor to fix it, the contractor often replaces it with one that's similar to the old one. We're trying to design policies that encourage contractors to explain the benefits of higher efficiency heating systems to their customers to break the cycle of old fuel burning equipment being replaced with new fuel burning equipment. By show of hands, how many of you would re likely rely on a contractor to pick the right heating system for your home? And, and the opposite of that would be that you would, you would be picking uh, your own heating system. So a show of hands, who, who would rely on a contractor to make that equipment choice uh, for you, for choosing the best system for your home? Wow, really? Okay. This is a, this is a, a savvy group. Savvy group. Um, is this going right. to take much longer? No, a couple of discussion prompts for you. So uh, two, two discussion prompts here. Um, cars and light duty trucks are the single largest source of climate pollution in Maryland. Transitioning to electric vehicles or EVs is critical for achieving the state's climate goals. The best-selling car in America is an EV, so the transition is well underway. Does anyone have concerns about owning an EV and would be willing to say briefly what your concerns are? Or are there any uh, EV owners who would describe their experience, positive or negative, of owning an EV? Yep. Well, uh, I rushed in here, so I didn't have the time to go plug in outside. So I texted my husband that I would be late to get home because they closed the staff charger in Stop of Marlboro. So, and I ran out of charge because the charger that I parked at all day at work apparently wasn't working. So just the process of charging effectively in Southern Maryland is really challenging right now. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we heard you on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Just bought a, an EV and it's been the greatest thing with our other car is a Subaru um, Forester, which we almost never drive anymore um, because the EV is smoother, it's quieter. Uh, just related to buy as I go by the gas stations. Uh, have, in general, you know, our, our son and grandkids live in Baltimore, so that's how far we have to go. We can easily make it back there. There and back, and we even lowered the maximum charge to save the life of the battery because most of the time we're going to most 60 miles uh, to have a letter now, something like that. Um, it's a great car, it's trouble free. Uh, the price was right. Um, the federal incentive was helpful. The state incentive was still right in here on. Yeah, great. We have an update from MDOT, uh, from Maryland Vehicle Administration. They, they do still have funds left for this fiscal year. They're processing the applications. Um, we cannot guarantee that all of the EV buyers in this fiscal year will get those incentives. But as of a few weeks ago, there was still a good amount of money left in that fund. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. And yes, ma'am. Over since 2005, so we really like the idea of going full electric. However, cost is a major factor. You know, we're both retired. <laughs> the, the price range is out of our budget. And the second thing is, I have concern about the traction of EV vehicles uh, in rain or snow. I've heard that their tires don't have the kind of traction that you might need in those conditions. Can, can I can add to my comment, the 
maintenance schedule for my car is check the wipers and the tires. Um, there's no oil to change, there's no radiator, uh, there's no spark plugs. You know, I, I expect to save on fuel, I expect to save on uh, maintenance. Thanks. And the, the car we got, I mean, I think prices will come down, but it hardly costs us anything. I mean, the, the rebate and uh, and they pay for our charger. Yeah, Chevrolet. Yeah, thank no you. Deal. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Dell. Thank you. Um, so I'm not anti EV or anti any car. I guess what I'm concerned about with I know that you guys are the implementers of legislation, so I respect that. Um, you don't pass the legislation, but you do have broad broad discretion. And I guess what I'm saying is, is um, being prescriptive of a certain technology is fundamentally anti-ethical to common sense. You don't prescribe a technology and say, this is the one. And that's what I'm afraid that you all are doing. Um, because what you're saying then, there's only one technology, and that's EV. This gentleman loves his car, and I think that's great. Someone else might want for a combustible engine car. And then there might come a car with a different technology from all of those, which is far better. Um, and so I, I would just encourage you to not be prescriptive. The other thing is, is on your slide, um, the young lady had on her slide, I'm not sure who presented it, uh, or who put it on the slide. Irrespective of the kind of, the kind of car that you purchase, even if it's an EV, you have on there, one of your goals is to reduce the miles traveled. What business, is, what business is it of yours to tell people they should reduce the miles they travel? It's a very good comment about uh, focusing on EVs. So EVs are most likely the solution for light duty vehicles. They're not necessarily the be all end all zero emission vehicle solution for all vehicle types. So let me, uh, uh, help explain that the regulations that we have set uh, re will require uh, manufacturers of light duty vehicles, medium and heavy duty vehicles to sell increasing percentages of zero emission vehicles. It's not, it's not specifically electric vehicles, but in the light duty vehicle class, we see that the, the zero emission vehicle technologies that are most abundant are electric vehicles. So we simplify things, especially when we talk about cars and talk about electric vehicles. But, but it's a good point that our regulations really uh, are uh, almost exclusively um, agnostic to the technology. Our focus is on the emissions. So we require that manufacturers will produce more zero emission vehicles. How they do that, the technologies they choose, appreciate that, but why put on the slide to reduce, reduce the miles traveled? I mean, how is that the business of MDE to even suggest to anyone that they should reduce the miles traveled? Because let's just say you have an EV and you're producing your own power with um, solar on your rooftop and you have a Tesla power, power back in your basement and you're creating all of your own power for your home and for your vehicle. What business is, is it of you, what I, how much I drive, and why is that something that you would even remotely suggest in your, in your slide? Yeah, we, we have no policies on the table that would focus on an individual's uh, driving habits uh, in terms of the, the mileage that they drive. VMT, uh, or the, these strategies are mostly focused on the strategies, the infrastructure projects that the Maryland Department of Transportation has to build the red line in Baltimore, for instance, and the purple line in uh, Prince George's and Montgomery counties. Uh, those transit projects and, and similar projects uh, help get some people uh, out of vehicles and onto public transit as as the populations that benefit from transit projects drive less, uh, that winds up being part of the emissions reductions that the state is able to achieve. Yep. Uh, let me, I, uh, so other hands came up, I think all in response to the EV prompt. Feel free to address additional EV considerations in your comments, which we'll turn to in a second. Last, last survey question though, 
Uh, the state government is currently prohibited from requiring manufacturers in Maryland to reduce climate pollution. The University of Maryland has produced two reports suggesting that the state should lift that prohibition and allow the manufacturing sector to, to participate in climate reduction, uh, pollution reduction programs of the state. Would anyone here like to share your opinion on whether or not to include or continue to exempt manufacturers from the state's plans to reduce climate pollution? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I, I have a question of clarification on that. Are they prohibited from participating in it now? Uh, the law or is said, the government just banned from enforcing them to participate in this? So agencies are, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the, this line in the statute. Um, agencies are prohibited from uh, requiring greenhouse gas emission reductions from the state's manufacturing sector. Okay, so the companies aren't prohibited from participating. It's keeping the government from enforcing. Oh, on a voluntary basis? Oh, no, no, no. Right. Yeah, okay, so no, I don't think they should lift that ban on the, on the state government at all. Would you consider showing hands on that question as well? Oh, sure. Uh, I have a comment. Yes. Yeah, Ellen, go ahead. Huh? I guess I just want to clarify that this is just sort of a chat around, or are you like counting votes? Or it's just meant, I, I just think that that's an important application. Yeah, and on the on the first two, that was more of a, a tally count, you know, to you know, in terms of the you know percentage of the the room that thinks solar power is a clean energy source, for instance. Uh, this is more individual public opinion on whether or not uh, manufacturers should be uh, required or not to um, have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from a, from a state policy perspective. Just a follow-up. Mm-hmm. So I can't imagine that I'm trying to clarity here. Sort of just a chat around that. Like, you know, if I'm going to raise my hand, am I voting, am I not voting? No, not on this one. I'm a little concerned that when the report comes out, there'll be a narrative about these questions that are just, you know, that they're not really questions. I mean, right. yeah. Oh, good, good, no, good clarification. It honestly never crossed my mind to to uh, to to pull these comments and and survey res responses into the final plan in that way. Um, no, what we what we will do um, is you know we're collecting the public comments. Uh, I'm sorry, the written comments. Uh, what we do is we we share all of the written comments that we receive. We all of the written comments that we receive, we review, we share with the relevant agencies uh, that need to see those comments, um, and then uh, uh, everything that that we receive will be uh, shared also publicly. Uh, what we did in the last climate plan is made that an appendix so that you can see all of the the written comments received. Um, I, I saw a couple. Maybe another hand, though, uh, specifically in reaction to that question, your, your, your own individual thoughts on uh, manufacturing uh, being included or exempt. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi. I, I would advocate for including manufacturing. I think that uh, sometimes manufacturers can say, oh, we really want to be on the leading edge and we want to implement some of these things voluntarily, but I think there are other times that uh, it can be good to have uh, policies that are more uh, forceful in ensuring that the emissions come down, such that myself and my youthful peers can have a nice, cool planet that you all have enjoyed. Um, it's important, and I would also say that I think economically, uh, you are going to be more likely to, the cutting edge of future technologies is going to be low emissions technologies, and so it actually will resound in your benefit, like the state economy's benefit, if the heavy industry is on the leading edge of adopting those technologies, because it's going to ensure that their workforces are uh, trained and at the leading edge and able to compete in the global marketplace. Thank you. And did I see uh, your hand, sir, and then I, we'll... I have a comment about the electric vehicles and the electric vehicles in the bus sector, the school bus sector specifically, 
you know, it's written in some of the laws here that we have to move to an electric vehicle on that end of it, which really doesn't have the range in, in rural, rural America. And it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to bring those in at this point because they can't meet those goals. And, you know, why aren't we considering other alternative fuels other than, say, diesel, like a biofuel for that school bus to convert that bus from a diesel power to a biofuel power that would be more environmentally friendly and would cost a third of what the electric buses cost. And they wouldn't have all this reoccurring cost of battery replacements and things of that nature. Um, I'd also further comment that I testified at Senate Bill 528 in good faith. I brought up the biofuel issue when they were trying to mandate fossil fuels being eliminated from the uh, building sector. That was agreed to by all the senators and all the, the delegates that also, in good faith, made a comment that yes, they would support the bill after those provisions were put in. SB 528 is not reflected in this at all. It has nothing in there at all about biofuels in the, in the building sector. The only mention of biofuels is in the cement manufacturing sector. So I don't understand where that disconnect is because this is supposed to be a reflection of that Maryland Climate you know, Change Committee that basically fostered by Senate Bill 528 that is now being presented in front of us. Um, it just seems like to me that that's a complete renege from what the senators and the delegates agreed to that and eventually supported the bill because they got provisions put into it. So can you comment on that at all? Do you, do you mean specifically the provisions that say that MDE and the development of building energy performance standards should consider the role of biofuels? It was, it's in SB 528, line four, page 101. It's on line four, I believe is where it is. And it basically says in that particular passage that inclusion of renewable low carbon biofuels, including biodiesel during the state's transition to an all electric building. What oh, you've got in front of you yep. doesn't state anything about biofuels That's at right. all. Uh, and number yeah. two, that, the fuels that we were going to use were are soybean based that would be could be grown in the state of Maryland, could be harvested in the state of Maryland, could be refined in the state of Maryland and created green beach jobs. And I'll finish up on one one last thing. I was actually appointed to be on the displaced fossil fuel worker committee. We have yet to meet, it's been two years, and we've yet to meet. And yet you're sitting in front of us telling us what we've got to do. And all of that reporting was supposed to come back before these transitions were to be taking place. I, I'm, I'm really, really lost. Because for two years, I have talked my head off about biofuels in particular. I sit on the National Oil Heat Board. And it just doesn't make any sense to me that, that you're pushing the agenda that you wanted to push in lieu of, you know, listing. It's no compromise to this. There is no inclusion in this of all these people. We can convert people that have homes today that heat their homes with oil to a biofuel that would meet the 2030 standard, okay, instead of converting them to electric for about one-tenth of the cost. So why isn't that in there? Because obviously we're trying to we're trying to move to a greener environment. The Oil Heat Association has been doing that for 25 years. So at the end of the day, why are you trying to mandate that all these people have to give up what they're acclimated to and what they've invested in and what their you know what their homes can take? And I don't think as a person in this room would would really argue with that when it's a low-income person. Why are you going to force them to spend 30 to 40 thousand dollars to convert to a total electric home when we could do that? in a much smoother transition at about a third of the cost. So all those things need to be really considered and put on the table, <clears throat> but these conversations don't take place so that you can even consider it. So great comments. Um, I, so the, the, the line that, that I think that you referenced is a requirement for the Department of Labor in their study to look at building codes. So the, the, uh, the Building Codes Administration and Labor and the Public Service Commission were required to do studies to look at this issue of, of uh, new construction standards. Those studies, well, Labor released its preliminary report. Uh, the electrification study at the Public Service Commission is underway, expected to wrap up uh, in a, the next few months. So th those are still underway, and we're waiting on the results of those uh, to formalize any 
policy perspective on new building standards, right? So the University of Maryland made some assumptions in, in their pathway report, but I'm just saying from a state policy perspective, it's, it's still very much an, an open question for us because those studies that the legislature called for are still underway, right? They're, they haven't been delivered. Um, you, yep. Isn't one of the part of the reasons why they want electric school buses is so they can, when they're not carrying children back and forth, reduce reverse energy back to the grid, and that's why they're not so interested in your vibe. That's one, one co-benefit of having EV school buses is that that is an enormous uh, energy storage device. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why you It'll also make the batteries wear out faster, which means we're going to have to put more money in. I, I guess I'm not familiar enough with that to know. Um, you, you mentioned, sir, the, um, the new, there were four new working groups of the Maryland Commission on Climate Change created. Uh, I know the governor's appointments office is still working to appoint members to them. Uh, that's been a, a slower process than anyone anticipated, so I apologize for uh, the delay in standing those up. Um, and in terms of biofuels competing with heat pumps, um, there, there is definitely a role for, for biofuels, but there's also a significant role for uh, heat pumps to continue to be they're already the number one heating solution in the United States. Um, and I sell HVAC for a living, and, and most of the homes, and I work for an oil company, and most of the homes we do offer a fossil fuel alternative. Um, some people want it, some people don't want it. Right now, it's not forced down their throat to have to take it. Um, the, the, the comment about do, do you trust your salesman, I, it speaks directly to me. It's like I'm going to go out there and try to pull the wool over somebody's eyes and you're questioning my and our company's integrity in that regard. I, I think it's a it's a it's a ridiculous question to be quite honest about it. And um, so moving forward, you as the state has to kind of guide, you know, where we are going to be. So we talk to customers and I've talked to them about inverter compressor technology to VRF systems for churches. We've installed all of it, which is all this high end stuff that you're talking about. I can tell you that I put a system in a church right here in Prince Frederick that cost them $300,000 and Smeco gave them $11,000 when they moved away from a air conditioning system to a heat pump system to, to try to curb their fossil fuel demand. And they gave them $11,000 because the mandates didn't dictate that they would give them any credit because of the energy savings from the fossil fuel in the winter months. This is absurd, absolutely ridiculous. You know, our company's been in business for almost 100 years, uh, five generations strong, one of the only five generation companies in the, in, the, in the state. At this point, if this continues down this path, and there is no fuel that we can sell, you know, we're going to have to look at other areas. So diversification is one of those things. Getting our workers trained to do something else, getting our company figured out what else that we can do that fits in the paradigm that you, you're trying to set forward. All, these are all good questions. That's what these committees were supposed to talk about. Yep. And that was those conversations should have taken place a year ago. And so that when you put your presentation up here, it should have some input from the people that are actually going to have to swallow what you're trying to feed. And I'm sorry for being you know ridiculous about that, but the answer is there has been no input. This is a completely lopsided thing that's all based on the Sierra Club and wind and energy power and, and everybody knows where this came from. Well, I'd, I'd say that we have been receiving a lot of input over the last number of years on these things. Um, but I, I definitely appreciate the point. And as someone responsible for being um, part, of, part of the reason why we haven't been able to launch those working groups as quickly, I apologize for the delay in that. And we're trying to secure the contract to uh, provide the technical assistance that those working groups need to perform the studies that were required uh, under law for them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was wondering, can you go back to your slide factor on the uh, sectors and what each sector is doing to help the Um, so, from my understanding, your algorithm is based on clean energy? 
No, so this is the result of um, a quite complex model. So this is what's known as a global integrated assessment model. So it's got all of the sectors of the economy that all um, are making decisions in time with each other as you go forward in the future. So based on the costs of different technologies, based on the cost of fuels, based on the supply and demand for each of these things, as you change the technology mix going forward, these sectors interact. So for instance, if you model an increase in electric vehicles, then the electricity sector has to respond and provide more electricity. And so with these different interactions and all of the requirements of the policies that are already in place, plus the ones we added, um, the sectors kind of make decisions based on what is the cheapest way to achieve the reductions needed. Uh, and this is the result of that uh, pathway. Yeah. So this is just to give us 9%, right? Because you said we're at 51% now, we're moving to 60%. But now we've got to move another 40% later on. So By 2045. Does that mean each of these sectors are going to be impacted times four, times five, times six, times 10 down the road to reduce their energy? And then what is the cost to us? What is the cost to me personally? That's what I'd like. So this report uh, was set up to focus on the 2031 goal. So we do model out to 2050, but we don't do a detailed policy pathway to 2045. So yes, there would be additional emissions reductions, um, and some of these policies do certainly contribute to that, but uh, that's a future study, so the state is required to do, I don't remember the year, but in a few years, uh, an December, additional study. Yeah. December 31st of 2029, the state's net zero emissions plan is due. Yeah, yeah. so that will be the, the 2045 um, study. And what's the cost to us? What is the cost to get to 9%? And then what is the cost to get to net zero? I don't know, where's... Yeah, yeah the, the um, net economic... Yes. So we're doing all the same 51 uh, <laughs> So. Uh, I think that the reason, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't speculate on the intent of the General Assembly, um, but we are required under the law to, um, to develop a path to achieve the state's GHG reduction targets while creating a net economic benefit to the state and net job growth. So the, the, all of the modeling that we've been doing for years and the plan presented uh, in the pathway report uh, meets our core objectives of it has to achieve the emissions reduction, it has to create net economic benefits, and it has to generate new jobs in Maryland. And the, the policy package here that uh, Dr. Kennedy's team modeled achieves those goals. Yeah, there's an awful lot of um, assumptions that are embedded in your model. Are those details in that publication that I saw online, it's like 118-page publication? Yes, that's because right. Because the so, only way you can, you've got to look at the details to understand where you're going to get 16,000 jobs from. Because clearly if you're removing some jobs, changing jobs is not a job created, it's just a change job. So that's the best the details behind all that. This is, this is a, a net job creation number, just to clarify that. Um, but yes, all of the details of the model are, are available in the report, and there's a technical appendix to that report that dives into even more detail. And then the model that we use is also open access, so anybody can go online and download this model. Um, it's available for public use. It was created by a national lab. It's, it's, anyone can look at it, yeah. Just one general comment. Your first question about having people raise their hand about what they thought was clean energy, that's a fundamentally flawed question. You can't ask that unless you have a definition of what you mean by clean energy source. Because you can talk about a solar panel, and by itself sitting in a field, yes, it generates electricity, but generation or manufacturing the solar panel itself, you've got to factor that in as well as what happens to the spent solar panel when it's done. Because neither one of those right now are, are clean processes. You've got to factor that in before you can ask a question. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you for putting together this presentation. But honestly, at this point, I don't know where to laugh at it or to be horrified by it. Um, I think these goals are completely 
completely unrealistic. I have deep concerns about the impact that for agriculture, you're talking about 2031, there's not a single charging station in the state that would charge a tractor or a heavy duty vehicle. We went over that last year. I have concerns about the requirement for the counties to pay for electric buses. Gentlemen over here mentioned it. That starts in 2025 that they're only allowed to buy electric school buses. That's a year and a half from now. I have concerns that my citizens that I represent in eight short years are not going to be able to find a way to pump gas into their car. So 95% of all Marylanders, and that's who has gas-powered vehicles, about 95% of all Marylanders are going to be forced to purchase a new car. What is the economic impact of that, of the entire state being forced to buy an EV? And what is the load of producing energy and effects on the grid for every single person to do that? Well, now you put up these, wait, I'm not finished, you can talk later, uh, I'll definitely finish. Now you can put up these pie in the sky charts and say, talk about dropping down emissions, you're going to cut emissions on cars and light duty vehicles by 60%. But honestly, it's merely not going to be open for pedestrians from other states. On your chart, by 30, 20, 35, you're talking about 100% clean energy. So nobody from Virginia, Pennsylvania, anyone traveling through the state of Maryland not going to buy gasoline? That's not realistic. I'm also concerned about legislation that was passed last year. There was a Senate Bill 611 that empowered a million dollars, close to a million dollars, to the Attorney General's office to investigate businesses and people for climate change infractions. That's reading between the lines. Look, I think we all support if the economy and, and, and through, I guess, competition, these businesses, consumers purchasing electric vehicles. I know myself, I would love to just disconnect from the grid at some point. That'd be great. As soon as Elon Musk makes an aesthetically pleasing shingle, that's affordable. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'll probably do that. But until that time, I really concerned about governments cracking down on people and forcing them to change their lifestyles when they don't want to. That is not the fundamental role of government. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we're really um, trying to design, find, find a suite of policies that are truly implementable, uh, which means not forcing people to do things that, that they don't want. So, uh, Farm equipment, not not projected to electrify uh, anytime soon. Chart. What's that? On your chart. So no, there's no specific modeling of electrification of farm equipment. Um, so we do model some electrification of non-road vehicles, but that's primarily like lawn mowers or forklifts or things that you know are pretty good cases for electrification. We don't specifically say there's going to be electric tractors. So in that calculation, your calculation is for everyone to have to buy a lawnmower in the state by 2035. Is that what you're telling me? No, no, not at all. <laughs> this is, it's thinking about new sales for people who would be buying a new one anyways. They might choose to get an electric rather than something else. Our, in other words, the way that, that we regulate uh, manufacturers is that we require that they produce increasing percentages of, for instance, zero emission vehicles. There's no requirement that you buy them. They, 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 they have. You don't have a power source, and there's nothing else left. I mean, there's we. People into those decisions. We. I think safe to say we're going to have gas stations in our state for a very long time. It's it, we're looking we're looking at at a, a transition of uh, the vehicle fleet that actually we I don't think that we have anything that draws medium and heavy duty out to zero emissions even for new for new out until the later half of this century. 
Um, so we've, we've, got, we've got fuel burning vehicles on the road for a very long time and we need, are gonna need a fueling infrastructure to support that. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a very long multi-decadal uh, transition that we're talking about here. I'm still waiting yes, to make a few comments. Yes, sir. Your power and I'll be out of your head here. Okay. Go for it. Can I do that? Yep. All right. We're sitting a few miles from the Calvert Cliffs uh, power station, all right? It generates 37% of the electricity in Maryland. 13 years ago when I was a commissioner in Charles County, there was a proposal to build a third reactor at Coward Cliffs that would have powered half the homes in Maryland. Now I'm absolutely bewildered why nuclear power would not be front and center in your strategy for powering Maryland. This is one of the fastest growing states in the country. All of the numbers on your charts are gonna go higher in terms of the need for electricity. We're gonna transition our entire automobile fleet in the entire state to EVs. And people think magically they're gonna plug their car into an EV station and there's not going to be a need for more power somewhere to power the electric vehicles. Besides the fact that we'll have more single occupancy cars on the road than we have today, we'll be building more highways for them, and so on and so on. The point I'm making is, history will not shed a tear for our missed opportunities. We have coexisted for 40 years in Southern Maryland with a carbon-free 37% production of electricity. Now, why isn't the state of Maryland making it a priority to take the lead nationally in more nuclear energy? Why is not the president and the governor working at the federal level to bring together a consortium of the best scientific minds in the world to create a template for the safest, most cost-effective nuclear production facilities in the world and open source those to every country in the world? Why isn't this happening? Why has the environmental movement in America, which I consider myself a part of, put the brakes for 40 years because of a few Hollywood movies to stop the development of safe, clean nuclear energy? That has to be front and center in your report. It's a missed opportunity. I've said my piece. I, thank you. Uh, yeah, Maryland. Uh, Mar Maryland celebrates uh, Calvert Cliffs for sure, and nuclear power is, uh, I think, very squarely in the eyes of uh, the Maryland Energy Administration as they develop the clean energy policy to achieve Governor Moore's goal of 100% clean power by 2035. Then let's see it on page one, in inch high letters. I guess from our perspective, from an emissions perspective, um, it's, it's encapsulated in the 100% clean power policy that is the backbone of the state's climate plan. It's not on your chart. We're, we're technology agnostic. If it's zero emissions, we, uh, we tend to be pretty Look celebratory. At the sidebar, you have every other source of electricity itemized, but you don't have nuclear itemized. So actually, this the chart I showed for the electricity sector only has emitting sources. So we have a different figure in the report that does absolutely include nuclear. You get my point. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm wondering, I was very gratified to hear that the symmetric companies are internally and voluntarily working on getting legal practices going. And I wonder if any other 
industries or any other business organizations have approached you folks and said, we get it, we really have to do something about this climate stuff. How can we work together to make it palatable to our customers? Uh, you know, is there any interaction with the business community? Here in Southern Maryland, that would be small businesses primarily, chambers of commerce and other organizations uh, where people yeah. can um, seek solutions together. Uh, yes. So uh, my answer to that is, has less to do with all of, like the individual meetings that I've taken with with business, um, but certainly the answer even then is is still yes. There are large uh, and small businesses in Maryland that have made their own voluntary commitments to achieve net zero emissions by a variety of dates, right? Including large utility companies, BGE, and others that have you know net zero plans. Um, the cement industry writ large, I think, is it right to say globally that they're globally f focused on net zero emissions by 2050 as an industry, which is, I just want to say, significant for an industry uh, that doesn't just have the challenge of producing CO2 emissions when they burn fuel, but also it's a natural byproduct of the, the process of creating cement. It releases CO2. So, um, so there is... Um, uh, there's a long, long list of, of, uh, of private entities um, that have made very strong uh, climate commitments. Uh, yes? Yeah, a couple of things. First, I did read the whole report, and I thought it was good, and I did not feel like I was being forced into doing things. I think your uh, neutrality on different technologies is good. Um, I thought that you didn't spell out as well as it could be the negative ben or the um, benefits because you've just got a few things dollarized up there. But climate change is a major negative force multiplier. And so if climate change is not stopped with Maryland doing its, its part, then we'll have infrastructure problems, security problems, forced migration problems, insurance problems. And obviously you can't put all of that in your model and you can't give us a dollar figure, but I think it would be correct to include that as, as part of the general um, picture. Uh, and the third thing is much more um, just a to-do, and you probably already plan to do this, it was not easy to take the big picture and say, um, what are the specific things that a county can do to participate? And what are the resources they need? What are the specific things that nonprofits can do? You mentioned that there are federal funds that can get trickled down through the county to um, community organizations, but it wasn't clear how to do that. I don't think you could put everything in this report, but if that was a, a later stage in the um, plan that you put out, that would be helpful. Thank you for those comments. The um, yeah, our, so our. Uh, economic modeling so far has focused on very traditional economic uh, measures, in, in part because of our requirements under the law. One of the things that we uh, will will try to do, uh, based on some some existing metrics out there, uh, for the final report, is also to express kind of what's what's the global good that's created based on some common measures for that by reducing emissions by the amount that we have the opportunity to reduce. So thanks for that. Um, and a quick note about, you know, d disaggregating this wonky state level policy into like more localized action. Uh, just a quick note that we received a $3 million grant from the EPA to uh, do that sort of planning with the counties. There are actually a number of counties that are in different sort of planning clusters. But anyhow, MDE uh, will be uh, working in the coming months with counties to, to help uh, figure out like what are those local climate plans uh, looking like? What are the priority decarbonization projects, if you will, in um, counties across Maryland? And then that actually rolls up next spring to a big application that we have to get 
um, up to, it's part of a pot of $4.6 billion that the US EPA has for priority decarbonization projects. So we're gonna be working with the counties on, um, on identifying those funding needs soon. Will the, will the counties, the individual counties going to the business sector in that be involved in that process? That's a good question. I'm not involved with uh, the rollout of that outreach program. So uh, let me find out and I can get back to you. A large part of the problem is what you had indicated was how many people are coming to the table. We've been trying to get a seat at this table for years. And unfortunately, we can't get a seat at the table to have a conversation. And that's where the problem is. The Biden administration the Inflation Reduction Act put a half a billion dollars set aside for biofuel refineries. We, no one has looked at this in the state of Maryland. These would all be positive, green jobs, everything like that, for example. But the conversation can't take place until you get into this meeting. And then at this point, this probably won't go any further. Because I've been in front of many delegates and many senators, and the conversation doesn't get any further than me talk. And unfortunately, that's the case. So whether you like it or not, you can say all the things that you want to. It's got to take somebody to react to this and say, we need to talk to that guy, or we need to talk to that industry, or we need to talk to those business partners in cleaning up the environment. Because as an oil company, we've been trying to clean up our environment for the last 30 years, Blackie, wouldn't you say, or more? I mean, we probably are one of the most regulated industries out there in terms of trying to present a cleaner product. But yet, we're not having this conversation. I have never talked with any of you. Thank you. Uh, I saw first a hand can I, back can I there. Can on the funding, though, just oh, well, can, sorry, can you hold on to it for just a sec? I, I, I've been pointing at multiple times. And, and, so, um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm a climate scientist. I am not a policy person. But I, at, at reading the report, I was heartened to see meaningful action happening to reduce emissions in a way that needs to happen. And I've been waiting for it for a long, very long time. Um, I hear a lot of complaints about the costs of doing this. But um, as a climate scientist, I know that the cost of not doing it is, is likely even more because of the fact that we feel climate change as a change in extreme events. And when we have a lot more floods, droughts, massive hurricanes, and we have problems with being wiped out, we've, it, we've seen the news, and it's not just a news bias. The data, the climate data show that this is a problem in getting worse. If we don't do something, it's going to be more expensive. So I just, I just want to say thank you for all the work to, to make the policy things happen. And only because I was nerding out on some economic papers earlier today, uh, I think that what I read was that the, the cost of inaction is equivalent to like 7 to 10 percent of uh, global GDP. And the cost of action is projected to be, I think, 1 to 3 percent of global, global GDP. So there's more and more economic uh, research coming out about uh, to, to that point. The cost of inaction is much worse than the cost of action. Uh, you had a question about, um, sorry, the, the funding? Oh, I was just gonna answer the question that was asked earlier. I wanted to clarify something you said about funding. Yeah. So that funding source that comes to Maryland also is specifically for areas outside of DMVs, yeah. which means, or you know, out of, you know, whatever it is, it, basically metro areas, yep. and thus that funding is specifically targeted for counties like Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's. Um, second, the process as to how to get involved with what's going on between the counties and the state. So I run the Department of Environment for Bridge versus County. We have my personal capacity, but just this is what I know. Um, it goes to the executive branch. So specifically the people that, you, that are being asked how that coordination will happen are in your executive branch, not in your legislative branch locally. So it's your county, it's your county executive or county administrator that is who you specifically want to lobby to make sure that you get the seat at that table. Perfect. So just thank you very much. Yes, sir. Just um, some feedback from a person who read the report, just with no agenda. There's a lot in the report about reductions and reductions and reductions and shifting things to electric, which, okay. But I couldn't figure out how we're gonna increase the electric for all the things we're shifting over to electric. I mean, Gary mentioned nuclear. 
And so nuclear makes up 37% of our electric grid. And, and as far as I can tell, 63% of our electric grid is natural gas, coal, and petroleum. So how are we increasing the electricity on the electric grid? I didn't get that sense in the report. So that's just an observation. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, although I'll turn that to Dr. Kennedy in a second to express kind of what their modeling projects in terms of the, well, one, yes, growth in total consumption, right? Because we're talking about electrifying a lot of things that are currently fossil fuel end uses. Uh, but then the shift in the resources that accomplish that, though uh, I need to point out, we haven't designed the clean energy policy. So there's a lot of, of what Dr. Kennedy might say that is really in flux because the clean energy policy to meet Governor Moore's goal um, is not on the table yet. Yeah, so um, we do model this in the report. So if you go to the electricity sector section, you'll see charts of electricity generation and the different technologies that are generating within the state, as well as imported electricity within the state. Um, and then there's another chart just below that of where that electricity is being consumed, if it's by transportation or buildings, um, et cetera. And so absolutely, uh, overall electricity demand is expected to grow. Um, to meet that demand, we do implement all of the state's existing policies. So what the state has on the books is included in our model. Beyond that, the model makes the decisions based on the cost of the technologies. So if it's cheaper to build a solar panel, the model will do that. If it's cheaper to build a gas plant with CCS, the model will do that, et cetera. So the, the model is kind of making those choices in response to the increasing demand as it goes forward. Yes, ma'am. So I just wanted to add my voice to the people in the room who consider climate change a far greater threat to my grandchildren, my children, my grandchildren, than any regulations or mandates about what kind of car they have to drive or what kind of fuel they have to use. And I want to thank you for um, the work that, you, that you've done. I think it's really important that Maryland moves forward with this. We can't keep our heads in the sand. And I'm really proud that Maryland is at the forefront of all this. Um, one, I, I have to admit I didn't read the report, so I apologize if this is already in there. But one thing that I would hope the state might do is work with counties on things like zoning that um, can be altered in ways that could be really helpful. For example, in Calvert County right now, um, if a subdivision, um, either existing or being built, wants to include community solar, so take a lot, for example, and put solar panels there, they're not allowed to do that. You can put it on your roof, but you can't pr provide uh, solar, for example, for your community. Um, and uh, especially if you're in a uh, older subdivision, heavily forested here, it kind of gives you a choice between cutting trees, which you don't want to do, or not being able to do solar on a lot of roofs. So I think there may be a lot, and, and that's just one example, but I think there may be some zoning things that would make it easier to generate more fuel energy. Great, thank you. I, I don't remember the name of it. I know the Maryland Energy Administration is running a solar task force right now, exploring some of, some of these issues. Um, all right, let's see. Yes, sir. We can also look outside the box in many ways. You know, over the last few years, we've seen uh, uh, various apps grow on uh, people's phones where they can order food or whatnot, you know. And, but uh, if I, I have already installed a 50 amp plug on the side of my house. I don't own an EV. But if there was an app that existed where somebody could say, hey, where's the nearest one? You know, oh, there's a, at, at this house over there, somebody could park in my driveway. Mm -hmm pay me 50 bucks or, 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 or 14 dollars or whatever it is and then get a charge and then and then be on the way you know and, and, and so they yep. outside the box there's um there, there's so many cool things that policy can't begin to touch um but uh but friends of mine in the technology space are constantly blowing my minds with the um completely unregulated solutions uh, for a lot of this. And it's, yeah, there's some really interesting things happening with virtual power plants and yada, yada. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, just to follow up. Um, well, MDE means 
take into consideration as they want to electrify the grid and EVs, the external pollution that's created many times outside the state as a result of the massive rare earth mineral minerals that are going to be needed for significant power line upgrades, um, for the cobalt that goes into electric batteries, which are significantly polluting the Congo, the jungle, um, in real time, as a matter of fact. And as well as the other rare earth minerals like lithium, for example, and the mining and the massive pollution that that causes as a result of it's interesting, um, and I only know about this because I'm on the committee and I have an opportunity, and I was really shocked. And as I said, I don't, I think it's perfectly fine for anyone to buy an EV if they want to. It never will I ever try to deny someone the right to, to choose what they want. But I'm wondering if NDE is going to include in its report the massive external pollution that you are creating as a result of policies that want to put only EVs and only electrification of the grid in the state of Maryland. I think the companies are working. They're I like the test of taking cobalt out of the batteries. And I read something that said that the mining for cobalt worldwide is in the millions of tons, while the mining of fossil fuels is in the hundreds of billions of tons. And uh, you know, there's no question that we uh, have to do this. There is no choice. I think education, I don't know if anywhere in your plan is education, but um, you can read the local paper. The last week there was a, a letter to the editor saying, you know, the volcanoes were heating up the oceans and that we needed to get more CO2 in the atmosphere so we could melt the glaciers to stop desertification. And I think there are just so many people who don't understand that our science is incredibly advanced. We have thousands of climate scientists who work decades on this. The, the, the fact that climate change is human caused by burning fossil fuels is no longer in debate. It's right. set up so science. I, so I, I, I have a question. But people people don't understand that, so they don't understand. So I have a people question. Have man, they have to do this. Yeah. So I have a question on the table, and my table, my question on the table is, I think, very well intended. And I, I guess yes, I appreciate sir. the gentleman is all in on EVs, and I respect his opinion to be all in on EVs. He has the right to do that. Um, but I don't believe science stops at EVs. I think innovation continues and continues on a daily basis. And, and I, I don't believe in this. All science that we've ever known stops when you find out your car. There's nothing else left. So my point to you, and I, and I think that's, that's somewhat what concerns me, what I've been hearing, um, not here, but just in the General Assembly, that there's a lack of understanding of the massive pollution that we're creating in other countries as a result of this. And so my question to you is, will that cost be accounted for in the final report? I'm so glad that you asked that question. If there's, if there's one thing that I think perplexes um, uh, and, and, and keeps my, my colleagues, you know, fellow uh, regulators, policymakers up at night, is thinking about all of the intersectional issues with, with every seemingly miniature decision that, that we make. And the, um, so, so, one, we're required under the law to produce a plan that achieves GHG reductions as measured by how we have to measure it according to the statute, right? So that means that our plan has to reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions. That means greenhouse gas emissions produced here in the geographic boundaries of the state of Maryland and accounting for any emissions from power generators that are importing uh, their power to Maryland, right? That's what we account for. That's what we have to hit as a goal. But when we make policy level decisions, life cycle emissions accounting becomes a very important factor. We have tools on the table to reduce statewide emissions that we're not ready to execute because they have, there, there are impacts to those policies that go beyond state borders. And, and yes, sir, it's a good point. And it is something that, that we think about a lot and jiving those things, our, our required accounting with the, um, the considerations of, of the ripple effects of that 
um, is something that we give great thought to. Yeah. Um, quick note on time. We're at about 7.30, which was the advertised end time. Uh, I certainly don't mean to, to hold anyone here, though I'm happy to stay behind for a few more minutes uh, to hear the, the few uh, hands that are already up. So, uh, yes, sir, and there's at least two more. Yep. There just be one point I would like to make. About 30 or 40 years ago, the electrical utilities were mandated to move away from coal. And most of them have, in Southern Maryland in particular, have now sunset. And they were replaced with natural gas, mm -hmm. power plant, like power generation. Now you're telling them, oh, we made a mistake. We should never have had to go to natural gas. So there's all thinking in all of the scientific things. Because I can guarantee you that this wasn't just a willy-nilly thing. Let's move from coal to natural gas. They actually thought that they were doing something sustainable mm -hmm. and something that would lower our emissions. The panda plant over on Billingsley hasn't been completed, I don't believe, as of yet. But yet we're saying by X year that they've got to get rid of the natural gas because it's not going to meet the standards for power generation. Okay. That they're no they're they're are technologies that can be deployed uh, that would mitigate the climate impacts of a natural gas power plant. So we're, we're not saying that there will be no more natural gas power plants in the state. And, and you know, just so you know, Maryland had um, the worst air quality east of the Mississippi for almost my entire life. Um, and last year was the first year that we uh, achieved all of our national air quality standards. We have much, much better public health and air quality in Maryland today. And the, the main reason was because in 2006, we had 18 coal fire power plants. Today, we have three. Uh, that transition from coal to natural gas is a major factor in the cleaning up of our air and reducing emissions. But in the building sector, yep. you're gonna mandate that they can't use it. Well, there are lots of clean technologies, and even for those power plants, we're going to eventually require, and the, the proposed uh, power plant regulation that the US EPA has put out has, has also said, you can continue to be a natural gas power plant, but you're going to have to have some mitigation technologies to reduce your CO2 emissions. Without methane? I'm sorry? Methane emissions from the natural gas. Yep, we account yeah. for that too. So we have a big pipeline coming in for the LNG plant in Love State, yep. and that's and they're, and they're, they're supposedly that we're going to monitor emissions of methane, but we haven't heard anything about that. And it's a very high acid rate in our area. Um, the health department is not publishing all the statistics on it, but it, it's expanding now, the, the pipeline from track gas and space. And there's no, we don't know what's going on. I would also like to say, I don't know, why, why didn't Maryland consider hybrid cars as a transition to electric? I mean, it seems like this is a good technology. When you're just driving through the neighborhood, you're on to the electric. Yeah, sorry, I probably oversimplified when I said earlier that we that uh, the requirement is only for zero emission vehicles. There's there's also an allowance for uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and and certainly uh, traditional hybrids are definitely part of that transition. So sorry if I glossed over to that earlier for sure. Um, uh, let me take a comment here, and then uh, here, and then uh, again. I'm happy to stay after the event for another couple minutes if you have additional comments. Uh, but let me take these two, and then we'll we'll do a, a very quick uh, uh, closing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a climate economist. I'm also a candidate for Congress here in Southern Maryland. Uh, Democratic candidate. Um, my name's uh, So a couple things I would love to see in the report is we. You talked a lot about those trade-offs. I would love to see at least notes about them, particularly <coughs> for us in local government, because I work in my day job in local government. They're doing that are doing the actual you know implementation. So that means thinking about as there are fewer gas stations, they don't get abandoned and we don't have, you know, how we're gonna deal with the abandoned tanks in the ground. It's thinking about trees versus solar. How are we gonna make sure that that trade-off is done in a, in a great way? Thinking about how we're gonna bring battery recycling here. Thinking about how we're gonna bring solar recycling here. All of those things are the economic, or extractivism. All of the economic trade-offs, it would be really great to have some information on what you guys thought about that since you have a room full of experts to do it. 
Um, two, I really like to see the MDE work on lowering the barriers to accessing funds for communities because it is really hard to deal with IRA funds. It, I got a great grant from USDA. It's been seven months of back and forths. So having the state serve as a, you know, as a center of those grant funds is going to accelerate that transition because you guys are going to be able to make it easier for us that are locals to do that. Uh, three, I'd really like to see more focus on the displaced workers. It really concerns me, the gentleman left, but about uh, you know not knowing what's going to happen. You know, I so stand in solidarity to United Auto Workers. I stand in solidarity with our plumbers and pipe fitters. We need to have good jobs for them. It is expensive to live here. There have to be good jobs, and so we have to think about the economic opportunity. We have to think about what this means for young people. There's a lot of gray hair in this room. There's a few young folks, but we want to make sure that. They understand what is their place in this transition. How do we keep them here? Because our kids are leaving in droves. So we need these jobs. We need this economic opportunity. So thinking about what that pathway is as they're growing up. Um, yeah, those are my concerns. And I'd like to see at least some sub notes in on the report or in follow up information that we get from NDE. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, one, I'd I, I feel like I constantly have to set expectations as low as possible on what we're going to be able to produce uh, this December, which, uh, you know, because of our review timeline with the governor's office means that we, like, after this event tonight, I need to start writing. So we have, um, uh, we've received a lot of requests for a lot of levels of detail in the final plan, and I just want to be as transparent as possible that um, we're, we're not going to be able to achieve all of the, the uh, good suggestions and ideas that we've heard for things to include in the plan. Follow up next but, year. But we're going to, yeah, well, part of the plan is frankly expressing that there are so many different steps ahead. I, I mentioned that CPR, the Climate Pollution Reduction Implementation Grant piece and the requirement for that, that we have a priority climate action plan that's due only three months after the state required plan and so on and so forth. Like we, there's the, the, the plan in December has certain requirements, but there are many additional pieces that will come thereafter, uh, much to everyone's chagrin, I think. Unless you're getting it out on time. My plan is a year and a half late, but I'm working on it. I, <laughs> we're, we're, we're working it too. Um, and yes, ma'am, you get the final word. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, say that when I look at your plan, that when you get finished with all of this that we're going to do and all the rights that people are going to lose, we're still going to be importing 37% about of our, our electricity from other states. And those other states in the PGM, at least seven of them, still use coal to generate their electricity. So since we know that pollution crosses state lines and that Maryland only produces 1% of the CO2 in the United States, 1%, and you're going to force us all to, to change our way of life, uh, to have people lose jobs, uh, to increase double the cost of electricity, and in the end, we're still going to be importing the same amount of electricity that we are today, and that the plan needs to have additional nuclear energy because it is uh, non-polluting and it, it is safe and it doesn't take up as much space. It takes up about one-seventh of the space that you would have to use, land you would have to use uh, for solar energy and it does not um, soil the ocean as I'm concerned that the uh, offshore wind um, is not a good solution. It may be in small small numbers, but the idea that you're going to put 60 of these 800 foot tall um, windmills in the ocean and have some hurricane blowing down as happened in North Carolina uh, and the blades are laying in the ocean and you've got to clean them up or it, it pollutes the ocean. So when we're doing a solution, we need to not pollute more. And so I think that that there needs to be a reconsideration of the mix of energy sources that we are going to have in Maryland. And I think we need to try to limit uh, how many rights and privileges we take away from the citizens uh, by telling them that they've got to live in uh, very highly packed apartments or communities and reduce the number of miles they drive and have a certain kind of car uh, and, and you're going to use big trucks 
and they have to have heavier batteries to be all electric, and then they can't carry as many products. So therefore, the cost of every product you buy is going to be increased. So for all these reasons, I am very concerned about this push to both, both the timing, how quickly you want to do it, and the proportion you're doing it. And then we're not talking about all of the, uh, the sources of solar panels coming from China that are being produced with coal uh, energy. And that pollution still makes its way around the world and has the tech impact on all the people. So we need to have more truth in advertising, if you will, about some of these issues and about the rare minerals that are being, uh, in some cases, being mined by hand by women and children in Africa. And then we're using them and we're all very pleased with ourselves because we have clean energy. Thank you. Well, that's the final word. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, December 31st of this year is our due date for producing the state's final plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 60% by 2031. Uh, again, setting the bar low, but we hope to achieve most of your uh, hopes and wishes with, with this plan. Thank you for the input that you provided. Uh, much appreciated.